Okay, uh, folks, uh, Mary was going to uh, update you on the, the Garden for Wildlife program, and she will when I'm finished. And then she was going to introduce me. I'm Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware. Uh, and my job today is to tell you what we know about keystone plants, how we, how we learned it, where we go from here. Uh, and that is what I'm going to do. They are, I'm claiming, essential members of every single landscape. And my goal is to get everybody to know that so that we start using them more. The story really starts with uh, E.O. Wilson, the great, greatest entomologist of all time, Harvard Emeritus at this point, who wrote a paper way back in 1987 called The Little Things That Run the World. And he was talking about what would happen if planet Earth were to lose the insects uh, that, that uh, he claims run the world. And his message was very simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. If most of our flowering plants disappear, that would so radically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the, the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fishes, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost uh, insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. Unfortunately, uh, we are now witnessing Wilson's predictions firsthand because we are in fact losing the little things that run the world. It's not by accident, folks. We are killing the little things that run the world. When I was young, and probably many of you as well, sites like this were common. Uh, you go on a, on a substantial drive and that's what your windshield used to look like. If you looked up at a street light, you'd see all the, the insects flying around it. Now we don't have to clean our windshields and you don't see anything flying around those, those lights. So it's anecdotal evidence, but um, there are people measuring it and, and the news is not good. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. And we're starting, you know, we've worried more about pollinators than other insects because, uh, because we worry about the honeybee, it's important. Um, we worry about the monarch. So a number of our, our uh, Midwest uh, native bee species have disappeared from their historic ranges. There are four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% just in the last 20 years. So don't get excited about that as if uh, it, that doesn't matter. They're not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. And that's the important thing. There are three species of bumblebees that may already be extinct. We haven't seen them in a long time. And 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. News is even worse in Europe. 30% of Europe's uh, orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets are facing extinction. Uh, a lot of the data has come out of Germany that has lost 79% of its flying insects since 1989. There are 46 species of moths and butterflies that have disappeared entirely from Germany. This is the big one though, invertebrate abundance mostly insects has declined 45% since 1974. And of course, as insects decline, all the things that, that require them, that depend on them are gonna decline as well. And we measure birds more than anything else because a lot of people like birds, but we got 432 species of North American birds threatened with extinction, not because there's only five left of each one, but because their, their population trajectories are headed down so steeply that that's the, that's the signal of impending extinction. There are now 3 billion fewer breeding birds today than there were, that should be 50 years ago. Those are gone already. Um, we went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we've lost 3 billion birds and divided those birds into the terrestrial birds into two groups, the birds that require insects at some part of their life history, mostly when they're reproducing, and the birds that don't, things like doves and finches that can reproduce on seeds. Most baby birds cannot eat seeds, but a few can. Well, the birds that can reproduce on seeds are not uh, disappearing. They, they, uh, their numbers didn't decline at all. But the birds that require insects have lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as you take away the insects, the birds are going to suffer as well. And so many things are connected to insects. And here's, here's the UN's latest report. We're going to actually lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. That's a, that's a report, but I'll tell you, it's not an option. <laughs> it's not an option to lose a million species. So we have to make sure that doesn't happen. Why? Why does it matter? It's the creatures that keep us alive. They're disappearing. 
not, not good at all. Why are insects declining? Uh, here are the major causes of insect declines. Insect declines have been, been caused, uh, called death by a thousand cuts because there's so many different um, causes. But the misuse and overuse of pesticides is a major cause. Habitat loss, you know, place to live in and food to eat, another major cause, of course. Plant choice, our choice of plants and the landscapes that we humans dominate it. Uh, and then our plant choice has also led to the, the uh, phenomenon that we call invasive species that are, these are plants that are displacing, displacing native plants in our natural areas almost everywhere. Light pollution, climate change, these are all impacting insects. Um, I see good news here, believe it or not, and that is that pesticides, habitat loss, plant choice, and light pollution, spelled wrong, uh, are all things that individuals can address. Invasive species and climate change, that's going to take collective action. But every one of us can address every one of these as soon as I stop talking. And tonight, you can turn out your, your lights. So we can, we can have a big impact. Um, let's right now focus on just one of those causes, and that's the impact of plant choice on insect declines. Um, we've been studying this for, I don't know, at least 15 years now. Uh, I'll just share the results of, of uh, one of our studies, but they're all the results say the same thing. We went into hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware and measured caterpillar communities in hedgerows that were invaded with non-native plants. So here's one with heavy uh, autumn olive and multiflora rose and everything else in invasion and compared the caterpillar populations to hedgerows that were not invaded. They were almost entirely native plants. And we found a 68% reduction in the, the number of species of caterpillars when they were invaded with non-natives, 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the actual amount of energy that those caterpillars are delivering to that, uh, those hedgerows. So if you're thinking of, of caterpillars as bird food, we reduced food, bird food by 96%. It's not a surprise that our birds are disappearing. What if I said to you, in, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%. I wouldn't have to explain that it's not a good idea to have all these, these introduced plants. And this is a result of poor plant choices on our, our part. Um, okay, we're not talking about bank accounts, but we're talking about insects. And insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. And it's our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. So it really is serious business when we look at the long term. In my view, the only option, viable option that we have is to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us, to live sustainably in the natural world that sustains us. Because what's the alternative? Living unsustainably? That, that's not long term. How are we going to do that? Well, let's start where we actually live. 85% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. We can't ignore conservation on private property. So let's start by making wise plant choices right at home. It's the easiest uh, uh, piece of, of ground that we can manipulate. We don't have to get anybody's permission to choose plants wisely. Now we want to choose plants that are going to support the insects that run the world, but which insects should we be focused on? Well, uh, there are a lot of insects in the world, three to four million species, most of them undescribed. Uh, we've got at least 164,000 described species in the U.S., but I, I tell you, I, I get undescribed species in my yard on a regular basis, so there's still a lot of undescribed species out there. We can't support all of them in our yard, so let's focus on two groups, the insects that maintain plant diversity and the insects that, of course, we want to maintain plant diversity because plants are, are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into food, but then we also need the insects that take that food from the plants and deliver it to other animals. If the food stays locked up in the plant tissues, we don't have the other animals. So we're really talking about pollinators and, and uh, I don't have to explain this very much. People understand we need pollinators to pollinate our flowering plants. But the other group is caterpillars. And we'll focus on both these briefly here. Why do we need pollinators? Well, you hear all the time we need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. And I don't like that argument at all because, uh, first of all, people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any, any pollinators, um, which is not true. And it's also an incorrect figure. It's about a twelfth of our, our crops are pollinated by, by, uh, by insects. Let's not think about our crops. Let's think about all the plants. 80% of our plants and 90% of our, our 
flowering plants are pollinated by animals and those are mostly insects. So losing our pollinators is not an option. We would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Simply not an option. And, and we're not suggesting good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. Not having pollinators is, it's not on the table. We have to have them. Why do we need caterpillars? Well, caterpillars, they're the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. They're the ones taking the energy from plants, the energy that's now locked up in plant parts and transferring it to other animals. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat the insects that ate, ate the plants. And it turns out caterpillars are transferring more energy than any other type of, 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 of plant eater. So designing landscapes that don't have a lot of, of caterpillars is designing landscapes that have dead, dead food webs, collapsed food webs. So a lot of people think, well, native plants are the solution to supporting both pollinators and caterpillars. And they're right, but there's a huge but in there. And that is that all natives don't support insects, these insects, equally well. So we have to be fussy about which natives we're choosing. We want to support the most insects with the fewest amount of plants. And what we have found is that just 5% of our native plants are supporting 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are supporting 90% of the caterpillars that are out there. Uh, and in terms of our, our bees, a third of our native bees require particular plants to reproduce. This pattern is consistent. We've tested it in all parts of the country, all the different biomes, the different uh, ecoregions. Uh, it doesn't matter what latitude you're at. It doesn't matter what the plant diversity is around you, whether you're, you're in the north or the south, or the wet zone or the, or the dry zones. There are just a few plants that are doing most of the work in our ecosystems. And if you want the details about how we came up with all that, uh, it's in this paper, Narango et al. Uh, came out in 2020, Nature, Ecology and Evolution. So we're calling these plants hyperproductive plants. I mean, these hyperproductive plants, we're calling keystone plants. You've, you've heard that term before. Remember what a keystone is. This is a Roman arch. A keystone is the stone in the center of that arch. And if you take the, the stone out, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of food webs, the food webs collapse because those, stone, those plants are making the, the most of the food. So keystone plants are essential to sustaining both uh, the caterpillars that are transferring energy from plants and the pollinators that are uh, creating those plants to begin with. So uh, I think about um, rebuilding the ecosystems in our yard as if you're building a, an ecological house. The keystone plants are the two by fours in that house. They are essential. They're holding that house up. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. Uh, so we have to have them. They're not, not negotiable. And just to give you a few examples of how important they are, in most uh, of the counties of North America, oaks are the most important keystone plant. They support 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic state. And, and you know, think of these caterpillars as bird food, 557 species of bird food, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. But there are other keystone genera out there. Willows support 456 species in the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, native prunus, things like black cherry, support uh, 456 as well. They're tied with, with willows. Uh, so the number of them that are supporting a lot of, of species. What about other trees? Things like tulip trees only support 21 species. So clearly not a top producer, not a keystone plant, but if you don't have tulip trees, you don't have the tulip tree silk moth. So there are specialist insects that depend on, on tulip trees. Milkweeds, we're all planting milkweeds for the monarch. It only supports 13 species of, of caterpillars, not a keystone plant. Does that mean we're not gonna plant it? No, because if we don't plant milkweeds, we're not gonna have, have the monarch. Uh, this is the dogbane flea beetle, or, um, the dogbane beetle. Um, it requires dogbane, of course. So it's another specialist on dogbane. And dogbane doesn't support a lot of, of insects either. So keystone plants support the most species. But to support host plant specialists, we need to use the plants on which all these insects have specialized. So let's go back to our house. We're building our house with these keystone plants. Uh, we need to flesh it out now, put in the walls, the wallpaper, and everything else. 
using plants that support the specialist. Then we have uh, the bulk, we have that biomass of insects that we need to run the food web, and we also have the diversity of insects that we need um, to keep things in, in balance. How did we discover the keystone plant concept? Well, years ago, uh, we, we looked at all of the plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states and went into the literature, over 4,000 references, and uh, just wrote down which insects are eating which plants. We focused on, on Lepidopter, moths and butterflies, because the, the host records for Lepidopter are the best. And we came up this, with this list and we ranked them. So uh, here we have Quercus 957. These plants here are supporting hundreds of species of, of Lepidoptera, whereas these plants are supporting tens or almost, you know, or sometimes none. Uh, so again, we said, well, there's a real pattern here. These are the, these are the uh, very, very strong producers. We're going to call them keystone plants. Note, keystone plants are categorized at the genus level. We've got the old, old Linnaeus said it was time to use a binomial system of classification where we use a genus followed by the species epithet. So if we're talking about oaks, the genus is Quercus. There are 91 species in this genus. So if you talk about the white oak, that's Quercus alba. That's just one single species. All of our listings here of, of plants, whether they're keystone or not, is at, are at the genus level. So people say, well, are all species in a keystone genus equally good? And that's a real good question. So for example, our, our, uh, is Quercus prinoides, the dwarf uh, chestnut oak, as good at supporting caterpillars as is white oak, Quercus alba? And the answer is, we don't have gen the data that can analyze every species uh, in a comparative way across, across the country. So the assumption is, that if you're planning member, any member of a keystone genus, uh, that's the best you can do in terms of supporting the, the caterpillars and the, and the pollinators around you. Um, so just assume that all members of a keystone genus are equally good, all native members, all native members. Non-native members are not equally good because they have not been uh, in this country long enough for our insects to adapt to them. Another important point here, keystone plants only play keystone roles within their native ranges. Uh, I've got grandkids that live in Portland, Oregon. I spent a lot of time out there and people in Portland, Oregon, um, landscape with a lot of, it's got a very Mediterranean climate. So they landscape with plants from all over the world, including a lot of our Eastern plants. They love red oaks, Well, red oaks are not native to Portland, Oregon. So we finally did an experiment comparing the uh, insect use of red oaks in Portland, Oregon versus uh, in Oxford, Pennsylvania, where, where I live. Uh, and there's a, a huge difference. The, the uh, oaks in Oxford, Pennsylvania are supporting, what, four times more, more insects than the, the oaks in Portland, Oregon. This is the same species. It's the same continent, but uh, it is grown out of its native range in Portland, Oregon. So it's not being effective as the keystone species that it is here in Oxford. An important point. Why do we need plants that make so many caterpillars? Uh, because it takes so many caterpillars to drive our food webs. Uh, you've all probably seen the statistic about, about chickadees, but there are actually many other birds where this has been done, looking at the number of caterpillars required to make a single, single clutch. Um, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees, just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's why we need plants that make tens of thousands of caterpillars. This is one species. All the birds are doing that. So, you know, you need hundreds of thousands of, of caterpillars to support even, even modest communities of birds in our neighborhoods. Other people ask, you know, if I plant a keystone tree in my yard, will all of these caterpillars come and defoliate it? And, and uh, I, I understand that question. But remember, everything wants to eat a caterpillar. So when you plant, yeah, no is the answer. When you plant uh, a keystone plant, caterpillars will come and eat it, but so will all of their natural enemies. And they've got a ton of natural enemies. When the moth lays its eggs, right away you get little parasitoids laying their eggs in these eggs. Uh, it takes out a big percentage of those eggs before they even hatch. There are all kinds of, of parasitoid uh, enemies, stachinid flies, um, lots of briconid and ichneumonid flies. Uh, most of the wasps, you know, wasps, uh, things like yellow jackets and, and um, paper wasps and hornets, uh, they are all 
predators and they're all eating caterpillars. So it's actually very difficult for a caterpillar to make it to uh, adulthood. And that's why your trees are not gonna be defoliated. When they are defoliated, it's typically by caterpillars that are invasive. They are non-native caterpillars like the gypsy moth, like the brown tail moth, like the winter moth from typically from Europe or Asia that are here without any of these natural enemies to keep them in check. Uh, so don't, you know, that we're talking about native caterpillars here uh, and they will not under most circumstances damage your plant in a way that you can even uh, notice. And don't forget all those birds eating those caterpillars too, hundreds a day from each, each individual that is out there. All right, let's talk about pollinators now. How do we help pollinators? Well, uh, Sam Drogi uh, has focused his research on native bees for a number of years now. He knows an awful lot about native bees, and he has recognized that uh, a lot of our native bees are specialists, meaning they can only reproduce on the plants, uh, the pollen of particular plants. And he says, those are the plants we should plant. We want to meet the needs of our specialists because the generalist bees uh, can reproduce on, on any of the plants that the specialists are using as well. If you only plant for generalist bees, things like bumblebees and honeybees, uh, then you're not supporting any of the specialist bees and you have a depauperate pollinator community. Why have bees specialized? Because there's so many differences among flowers. They differ, they flower at different times. They look different uh, from each other. They smell different from each other. Their pollen morphology is very different. These little nooks and crannies here on pollen grains are there for a reason. They're there, uh, they have co-evolved with the spacing of the hairs on the legs and abdomen of the specialized bees that are really good at transferring pollen. Uh, so the pollen is going to cling to those specialist bees much better than the generalist bees so that pollination is efficient. Uh, and uh, specialization also happens because the nutritional value of these pollen grains differs so much. Uh, so you can actually specialize on particular types of nutritional value. So all these differences have opened the door for specialization. Here's a really important point. Bees do not specialize on nectar. Nectar is sugar water. And yeah, there's some differences in the amount of sugar, uh, but it's the pollen they are specializing on. Most bees can use the nectar of any plant that they can access the nectar in. It depends on the length of their, their mouth parts. Um, and that explains why we see bees, native bees and non-native bees on non-native plants like uh, butterfly bush. Um, a lot of people plant butterfly bush and they say, well, there's butterflies on it and there's bees on it. It's a nectar supplier, but you don't see any specialized bees getting pollen from uh, butterfly bush or zinnias or any of the other non-native plants that we see bees on. They're getting nectar, but they will not be able to reproduce when these plants are the only flowering plants that we have around. So keystone plants for pollinators do not support the most bees. They support the most specialist bees. So the focus is on the specialist bees. It's not on the total bee community, the generalists, because the generalists will use these plants as well. Um, if you were to look across a, a number of the ecoregions in the country and to start ranking plants, um, these plant genera, starting with sunflowers, the, the, the various asters, I uh, remember the, uh, the genus aster was broken up into a number of, of genera, um, goldenrods, um, willows, even all the way down to violets. These guys all support a whole uh, great community of specialist bees. Um, there are many, many uh, uh, plants that are supporting specialist bees and a number of plants only support one or two species of specialist bees. And if you, you want those bees, you gotta have those plants. Uh, but these are the ones that are gonna support the, the most of them. And some of these plants also support the most caterpillars. When you're comparing um, herbaceous plants. So goldenrod, for example, in the mid-Atlantic states, that supports the most caterpillars, 110 species. It's also a top plant in terms of supporting specialist pollinators. It's definitely one you want to focus on. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we choose plants uh, wisely, uh, we can increase uh, the, the abundance and the diversity of both pollinators and caterpillars almost everywhere. Uh, so insect decline is a global problem, but it does have a grassroots solution. We created this problem, but I really believe that with keystone plants, we can solve it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Are you back, Mary? Yes, 
Doug, thank you so much. I am. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> and I am going, yes, and I apologize for that drop. I am going to share. We're very excited, Doug. That was amazing. And every time I hear you many times, but every time I learn so much more. Um, so thank you for that. And um, just I'm going to quickly share back. Um, and just for those of you that don't know, we are um, getting a lot of questions um, in the chat and in the Q&A. And if you have Q&A content related questions, please put them in the Q&A. We're going to address those in a few minutes. Um, and um, just, just as a little bit of background, um, since so many of you are on the call, we're up to almost 200 now. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm Mary Phillips. I lead a Garden for Wildlife. I've been here um, with National Wildlife Federation since 2014. Um, and I um, have been leading it. And in that time, we've been so excited. I've been doing a number of things, helped to launch the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge and a number of other um, types of efforts. Um, one of the things that we have really done is to reform the mission. And Doug has been so critical and a critical partner with us on this, is how do we figure out taking this message and the science that Doug has done, how do we make it easy and seamless for people to connect what they plant to this positive impact on wildlife? Um, so our vision is really to, um, you know, revolutionize the way people garden and landscape. And so that's where uh, Doug and uh, we are all on the same page uh, in our goals and the kind of transformation we see uh, wanting to happen uh, nationwide. Um, so one of the things we wanna do here is really just many of you know, and many of you have done Certified Wildlife Habitats um, and so appreciate that. That's been a signature program for National Wildlife Federation all these years. Um, but one of the things we keep getting messaged on is where do I find native plants? Now, many of you are master naturalists, master gardeners, and you know where to source your native plants and you have the time and energy to do that. But what we're seeing um, right now in order to do that kind of change that Doug said and get the message of native plants out to people, we are being inundated right now. Um, and you know the course pieces of certified wildlife habitat is providing this food, water, cover, and places for wildlife to raise their young. But what we're seeing is that, day, uh, that uh, Doug has said is that our wildlife obviously is rapidly disappearing. Um, and we know, as he also said, uh, wildlife thrives in areas with native plants. But what we also study is that native plants are not available at the scale. And particularly keystone native plants aren't available at scale. So we're going to share with you some resources today so you guys can help us also be ambassadors to getting out um, the message of what plants should be planted and where to find them and how we can easily help, especially novices who are new to this but wanna do something good for the planet, how they can actually um, take a first step in learning and understanding not only about keystone plants, but sometimes they've never heard of really what native plants are. So that's all key to actually addressing um, this challenge. Um, what we're seeing just as perspective, last year there was a 42% increase in gardening during the pandemic. And actually 88% of those gardens are intending to increase or maintain their levels of activity. If we don't help them understand, just don't throw in anything. <laughs> throw in things that's gonna make a difference for yourself, the planet, your backyard, and your family. Um, that's what native plants do. And the keystone native plants are particularly, um, as Doug shared, um, compelling and powerful um, in this process. So again, one in four people currently are purchasing plants because they're being marketed to that they help butterflies and bees and birds. Are they the right plants for the right place? We are working with the industry to help that be educated and marketed um, in a way that it actually they are the right plants and they're not treated with chemicals. So this is all what we're actually challenging all of you to help uh, in this um, mo movement that has really been around for quite a while, but it hasn't become as mainstream as it needs to be. And to Doug's point, if we can get those keystone plants, people educated and get them into um, the process on a national scale, we can change this decline. Um, so again, more, more stats about who is converting and who's not. So there is a movement here and there's lots of people doing it, but we need to get them the right plants. So as I said, the right plants for the right place. This is just summarizing some of what Doug just said. Um, and he, the other thing too, I just wanna do a little plug for Doug. Many of you do know, um, he just came out with a new book 
the nature of oaks, um, which is outstanding. So wanted to let you know that this was supposed to be my introduction of him before I got knocked off the internet. Um, and then of course, many of you are familiar with his um, nature's best hope. And I just, Doug, thank you again for your for your partnership and collaboration on all of this. You're so welcome. To the point of what we also wanted to share is we've had this amazing collaboration and working with Doug and he recommended that we also work with a pollen specialist um, uh, conservation as Jared Fowler, who has worked also closely with Sam Drogi, who um, Doug mentioned. Um, together, we have, uh, they have actually worked with us to provide these amazing lists. Um, and here's the URL, it's nwf.org slash keystone plants. And what we've provided um, in this process, uh, Doug showed you earlier the eco region um, list. We have done this by the top level eco regions. So there's 10 lists for right now. Um, and what um, I'll share a sample of one of those in a second, but basically they're for these um, eco region le level um, zones. So Eastern temperate forest, Great Plains, the Marine West Coast, Mediterranean, California, the Northern um, deserts and the others. Um, what I'm gonna do is go to this site and show you how you can access um, the ones, I think I have to stop share and share again, hold on. Um, I think it's gonna do it for me automatically and it doesn't. Um, here we go. So here's the list, the page. These are newly, it's newly live. It, you can click on the full map to find your state and then you can go into these different zones. I know I got a couple questions about the Marine West Coast Forest. So I'm gonna click on that as an example to show you what we have here. So what we've done is combined and defined so people understand what keystone native plants are and can, um, Doug and all, can you see those lists right now that I'm got? Well, you're on the main slide, you've got to- Oh, I got to click- Got to advance to the next list. Uh, can can you see Marine West? I think I have to stop share and share again. Sorry. When you click out of things, it doesn't always share. Here we go. Can you see that list? It's still the front, still the first page. Do you see Marine scroll, West? Scroll down. Scroll down, Mary. Oh, but you're but you can see the list. You can see the page. There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. No, I was okay. worried that you couldn't even see this. this oh document. no, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. So yes, yeah, so on each of these, we've listed the top keystone plant genera. Um, and this is a similar format for each of the eco regions. It lists as many people in the chat were asking um, what the genus is. And then it also tells you the numbers of um, species it helps. But not only did we do it for uh, Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, we also included um, the pollen specialists it helps. And as Doug mentioned, some pollen specialist um, plants also um, help our Lepidoptera and our keystone plants. So this shows you the combination of plants that if you plant them in your landscape, they are really power packed because they can help both the Lepidoptera, uh, the butterflies and moths and pollen specialist bees. So that is the top kind of for your area, but then we actually go and give you the top 30 for each of um, the two different kinds of lists, the butterfly and moth list, as well as the top host plants for pollen specialist bees. These are, as someone else asked in the um, chat, how can we help um, the, the local garden centers, um, the nurseries that are growing plants, know what would be really helpful to grow for your area? So we have these for each of um, the different zones. So this is just an example, and you can go to that link and I'll go back to that slide deck so you can see that. And um, hold on one second. So if you go to nwf.org Keystone Plants, you should find each of these lists um, for your area. But we also have, and Doug mentioned the research he did in the Mid-Atlantic some time ago. Well, he did even more than that in his research team they actually created amazing lists for us. Um, now, can you guys see the slide with the monarch? Are we back on that one? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just make sure we're moving ahead here. Um, so one of the things he also did was provide the native plant finder um, data. And we at nwf.org slash native plants, you can actually find um, for your zip code the Lepidoptera, the local species that are native, um, that support the top 
uh, numbers of Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths for where you live. So that's another tool um, that Doug has um, really helped us on and um, helped all of, all of us <laughs> on the planet on by providing this data. Um, so I wanted to just share those um, tools with you. The other thing we've done is we've gone a step forward and we've launched this new site, gardenforwildlife.org, which actually helps people um, understand a little bit about how native plants and particularly keystone plants help not only these wildlife, but really ourselves and the planet and you can go in and we've just piloted in the Northeast and a couple of mid-Atlantic states for this spring. And in the site, you can actually order um, a kit or a collection of native plants. And you can actually see how many native plants are actually being supported by that collection. It's kind of a DIY approach to native plant gardening. And not only that, we are um, advancing and um, enhancing the site um, and we are gonna be creating more storytelling and we're gonna be able to map where these keystone plants are being planted. So we can actually track every time someone um, purchases and plants a collection, we can actually track it. And the, 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 the individual who has made this commitment can actually learn and get tips. They get email different tips on what they can do to enhance their garden habitat, which species they can be seeing at different times of the year. Um, it's really an interactive experience so that it's not just buying a box of plants or, or plants off the shelf, but really helping people understand what they plant. It really is planting with a purpose and they can actually track that and show their impact. So this is something that we see, um, we are working with um, uh, uh, growers and we're creating a network of growers in different regions across the country so that these, individual growers understand, and they also know consumers are gonna come and actually buy this. One of the reasons we don't have native plants at the scale we need to have them is that at this mass scale, most growers can't rely on the consistency of consumer purchasing to be able to make it a profitable um, business endeavor. So what we're trying to do at National Wildlife Federation is actually help these folks have predictability and profit. Um, we are gonna be launching pre-orders in the fall and expanding to some um, more states. Um, so we'd love for you guys to check it out, try it out. Um, it's definitely for people, you get a garden design, you get the impact that you're making. It's much more of a hands-on kind of approach to helping people understand why this is important and how to do it. Many of you that are very seasoned, we'd love for you to partake as well, but. We know that there's so many people out there that are just being introduced to this for the first time. So wanted to make sure people knew those resources were available. And then we're gonna jump in here in a minute and take um, questions. This is another way to find it through social media, but um, just wanted to pause on that and we can jump into the questions now. Um, so please check out the plant list. Those are available to everyone. Um, and we will um, jump in here. Uh, and start doing some questions. I need to um, look here and see what we've got. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for these amazing questions. We have, again, a question here about many nurseries are unaware what plants are native to the area. How can we get details on what's actually native? This one's for Pennsylvania. Well, go to these new lists um, at nwf.org, Keystone Plants, and that will help you. Um, we're really, really excited about having you guys also, you know, be ambassadors with these um, local nurseries and growers. Oh, really good question. We have a lot of people madly raising monarchs in Ohio because this is important for them to be saved from predators. Is this a good idea? Doug, I have a somewhat answer to that, but I'd love for you to take that one. <laughs> it's a bit controversial. Yes, um, it, is. <laughs> it is true that, that when a monarch lays an egg, 96% uh, of those eggs will be killed by ants before they even hatch. So uh, mortality at the, in the early stages of any insect development is extremely high. That's normal. But of course, you know, monarchs are, are on the ropes and we want to help them. So it, it does make sense. You bring in those eggs and you will reduce predation. Uh, that, is, that is probably true. Everybody's not a perfect monarch rearer, so the mortality uh, during rearing is 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 also substantial. The you know the downsides are that uh, they're typically crowded. It it, it it could promote disease transmission, um, particularly something called OE. <clears throat> uh, so those are those are reasons that that uh, 
you know, some people d discourage it. On the other hand, for an awful lot of people, and especially kids, raising a monarch is one of the first serious introductions they have to the world of insects, the world of invertebrates. Uh, and just from an educational perspective alone, I, I think um, that's definitely a, a positive. It, what it does is develop that personal relationship with the natural world that then carries through people. You know, knowledge generates interest and interest generates compassion. And that's what we need, a whole lot of compassion towards, towards nature. That doesn't just happen. You have to experience it. Uh, so I think in that perspective, it is, it is worthwhile. The, the best way to help monarchs is to plant more milkweeds and let them do it on their on their own. Uh, we're not going to save monarchs by bringing them in and rearing them. It's just it seems like a big effort, but it's really minuscule compared to the um, right. what can happen in the wildlife in, 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 you know, in actual natural areas if we have enough, enough milkweeds. What is clobbered monarchs has been losing uh, milkweeds along our agricultural areas where we spray Roundup Ready corn and soybeans and, and replace all of the native weeds with lawn so you know you get tens of thousands of square miles of the midwest where you you don't have those plants anymore you don't have the milkweeds you don't have the asters and that's what has really really hurt the monarchs the most so um if you really want to help the monarchs plant the milkweeds uh but uh you know if you're responsible yeah. about rearing them it's it's just a great educational tool what were you going to say, Mary? <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on all of that. And I actually just put in the chat an amazing resource that we work closely with Monarch Joint Venture on about why or why not to raise monarchs. And it gives tips actually from the educational purposes that Doug mentioned. If you're going to do it, here's a really responsible way to do it. But it also advocates that you know there are ways that it can also potentially share disease and, and is not always effective. So I think that's a really good resource for that. And it pretty much sums up and gives you some tips from what Doug was just um, sharing. We've got another question here that says, uh, we've got um, some minor bees in our yard, but they're getting out of control. We can't even walk through the yard right now. Um, what, is there a safe way to limit bees? I know they're native, but they're out of control. I don't know what out of control means. I bet you not <laughs> one of those bees has stung you. So they do fly around and, you know, they look like they might and there's a cloud of them, but you walk right through them. You're going to make it to the other side. I guarantee it. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's the perception that there's there's an issue. I think that that you're having an issue with, um, you know, you if you if you don't want them where they are, you have to move the resource that they're using. And it's probably uh, a. Um, I don't know, a rock wall, a perfect type of, of soil. Um, can you reestablish that someplace else? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, a lot of people would be real happy to have a cloud of bees to walk through, but I understand what you're saying. So. Yeah. What, one of the things I've seen done is also to repurpose the area they have uh, nested in and actually add more in other different types of pollinator plants that attract other native species in that you're trying to help. So it kind of balances out a little bit. That's one of the other options I've seen. So um, how do we remove invasive plants from 54 acres of wooded property in Columbia <laughs> County, New York? Is there help out there? Well, gosh, so in New York State, there are groups that work um, on uh, moving, removing invasives. Um, we'd have to look up which organizations out there would be particularly helpful to you. Uh, Doug, I don't know if you know anyone in that area. Oh, not, not specifically. Uh, there are lots of groups. You know, this is the tragic part of invasive plants. They have invaded the entire country. We're talking about millions of acres that need, need to be managed. It is labor intensive and it's not a one shot deal. So when you get the local Bo Bo Boy Scout group to go and, and, you know, remove some of your buckthorn, that works temporarily, but you have to do it over and over again until you reestablish. We've got to reduce the seed rain that continually in, infects these areas with these invasives. When you remove invasives, you got to kill the roots. Otherwise, they come back uh, in, in weeks rather than years. Uh, and all of that is labor intensive. So, so um, this is why it's such a serious issue. It's why a lot of people give up because they don't want to work that hard. Uh, and 50 acres of, of, of invasives is a big deal. I will tell you that, that my wife, Cindy, has gotten rid of invasives on 10 acres single-handedly, but she works at it all the time. So it's, it is certainly possible. Um, but I don't know any... any um, any ways that don't involve a lot of a lot of uh, labor. 
You can, by the way, you know, a lot of people say, well, you remove them and then it's just this big blank slate. And of course they come right back. Natives come in there too. So there's two, two things that have to happen. You can, you can replant an area, it's called addition by subtraction. And all you do is continually move the, remove the plants you don't want, but protect the plants you do want. But one of the reasons our, our, our native plants do not outcompete invasive plants is the overpopulation of deer. If you, if you maintain an area where you've got too many deer, the deer eat the native plants far more often than the non-native plants and, and regenerating that area with native plants is really difficult uh, when the deer population's there because they won't eat the, the buckthorn or the autumn olive or all those other guys either. So there's yeah. a, it's this interaction. Um, controlling invasives without controlling deer is just about impossible. Thanks, Doug. Um, another question is about, I've been trying to remove ornamental plants and plant natives. Oh, this is particularly in Southeastern Ohio. Where can I find native uh, plants for host butterflies? Well, uh, end of life.org. <laughs> you can definitely uh, order some plants um, that are native to Southeastern Ohio um, for that, but you can also work in one of our other um, resources in nwf.org slash native plants. There are other uh, regional lists, and we do have some nurseries listed on some of the other host plant lists um, in that section of the website. Um, and particularly, um, you can find those for um, Ohio. Um, one of the things we also, just about geographic location in these lists, we have another question here is, I don't see a list for the Mid-Atlantic. Well, you do in the fact that these lists are at a larger eco-region level. Um, and so the Eastern temperate zone covers the Mid-Atlantic. But Doug, did you want to speak to how these lists were curated at the eco region level and how there are plants that have that broader native zone in genus at the genus level in these zones? Well, eco regions are broken down in, at, at several levels. The map you showed, Mary, is eco region one. That's the most right. general. Eco region two divides those up into a little bit finer scale. Uh, and it takes into account altitude and latitude a little bit better. But a number of these plants, so for example, red, red uh, oak that we talked about, if you look at the distribution of red oak, it's big. Uh, it goes from, from Canada uh, all the way down at least to southern, southern Georgia. Um, so what's this saying is that if you live in that region, you can plant red oak in any of those, those areas. Is that what you wanted me to say, Mary? <laughs> uh, yes, but now we have another question. I'm in Delaware. The forestry division is re recommending us to not plant red oaks or pin oaks. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, our oaks are under attack for a couple of serious diseases. We've got uh, the bacterial leaf scorch, which is hitting the red oak group, which is red oaks, pin oaks, black oaks, uh, very hard. Uh, we've got oak wilt, which is hitting both groups very hard. Uh, these are, are introduced diseases, uh, and, and I know about that recommendation. Don't plant it because they're going to get sick. Well, the end result of that is to lose our major forest trees that are all under attack from something. The ash that are attacked from the emerald ash borer, and I mean, you can go right down the list. Something's attacking all of these trees, and if we say we're not going to plant any of them, that's ecological disaster. What we need to do is find resistance to all of these diseases. And the only way to do that is to plant more than ever and watch the ones that survive, even if it's just a small percentage. You know, I, I, we lost a great opportunity with the chestnut blight. We brought in the chestnut blight. It started killing the chestnuts and the logging industry said, well, they're all dying anyway. We'll take every single one. They did. They cut down every chestnut that was out there. And if it was a half a percent or one percent that had some resistance, those genes were lost because we cut them down. Um, I, I don't want to do that. I know that there's there's variability in resistance to the oak leaf scorch because I've got it on my property. I've got uh, two trees that have already died, but there's a number that are doing really well. Those are the ones we want to favor. If I had, you know, if I, if years ago somebody said, don't plant any red oaks because they're going to get sick, I wouldn't have been able to look at that, that variability. And blue jays, by the way, are going to help us with this this uh, disease resistance because the only oaks that will make good acorns 
that the Blue Jays will then disperse are the healthy ones. They're not going to disperse the acorns from sick trees. So, mm. but we have to have those healthy trees around. You know, there is some resistance showing up even for emerald ash borer, which has devastated the ashes. There's a population in Michigan that has not died. That's what we have to look for. Mm -hmm. So not planting any of them is, we're never going to find it that way. So, so I, I am in, in direct disagreement with the forestry specialists on this, and I know that. So then, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Um, someone else said, I recall there's a website that you can enter your address and it gives a ranked list of the most beneficial plants. Yes, that is nwf.org slash native plant finder. You put in your zip code and it will give you the ranked list of the top um, plants that support the highest numbers of butterflies and moths. Um, another for, for your county in your yes, county for your county yes thank you for clarifying thank you I have planted many native plants I'm now concerned about a plant that could I guess in its soil have jumping worms which are an invasive worm I we, we've done that we actually just did a story on that National Wildlife uh, Federation magazine which I can share in the link in a minute but how high is this risk and how can I eliminate or reduce this risk of transferring the, the jumping worms, which is an invasive type of earthworm. I don't know if you- You do not want jumping worms. No, we do if not. If you but think that you have jumping worm in a pot or a bald and burlap plant, you it. do want to be very, very cautious. If you don't have it now, you don't want to introduce it. It is, it is terrible. And it's another one of these invasives that we don't have uh, any good good uh, option for control. So if you have a plant already and you think it's in, in, if the root ball is infested, I'm not sure how you would know that or why, or if, you're, if you transplanted that. it from an area that has worms, I don't, I don't know, but yeah. don't plant it. Um, you don't want those worms. Okay. No, <laughs> oh, and by really the way, by the way, they overwinter as egg sacs. So if you buy a plant in de December or something, or if you have a, a, a plant where the worms are already dead, but the, the egg sacs are in the soil, you'll never know it. So if you're transferring, if you're buying a plant from an area that you know is heavily infested, be very cautious about that. So one way also to protect this is um, the plants that I mentioned that we are uh, launching this year, we launched this spring and we'll be s selling different combinations of native plants by region over time. We are working with a group called Plant Century um, that actually works with the horticultural industry to stay on tops of these kinds of invasive trends. And they actually work and any of the growers that we will be working with are actually certified by Plant Century. Their um, facilities are inspected, their soil has to be tested periodically. Um, also all the departments of agriculture and extension um, offices are often working with all these growers as well. And they require specific um, certificates, particularly around some of these other invasive um, diseases as well. So um, that's key is to work with a source that you know is inspected routinely and is on top of these kinds of um, invasive uh, challenges, both uh, species and pests um, and, and disease. I mean, um, and that's something that we are trying to make sure as National Wildlife Federation that we're working to accredit um, many of, this, of these folks in this growers network so that this stuff is not spread. Um, I think that's really um, important. Um, let's see, uh, Mediterranean California, we are in perpetual drought and have limited water. Will this be a problem for our uh, keystone plants. Um, is this keystone plant list for this area of Mediterranean, California, also drought friendly? Any keystone plant from, from California. California is difficult because you got so many different bioregions, so you have to be specific. Um, but those plants, the keystone plants are always native, so they're, they are used to the droughts of California. They're adapted to them except the droughts in California now are the worst they have been in many centuries. So um, it's tough on any plant. There's no doubt about it. But the bet, the only, your only option for dealing with droughty plants, droughty regions, is to plant the native plants that are, are pre-adapted to those dry conditions. And there are many of them. Okay, thank you. Are you aware, Doug, this is another question we got about the toxicity. Many of our native plants, particularly milkweed, have toxins in it that make, that's why the caterpillars 
<laughs> and milkweed and monarchs have this co-evolved relationship is that the toxins in the plant do not help, do not hurt milkweed caterpillars, which makes them not very friendly to their predators. But people are always worried about the toxins in some native plants to their dogs, pets, uh, and children. I don't know if you. Right. Uh, I, I do get requests. Give me a list of plants that my kids can eat with, without any effects or my dog can eat. I don't know about your kids. My kids never ate plants. We can't even yes. get them to eat their vegetables. <laughs> yes, so exactly. almost yeah. any plant out there has, mm -hmm. they've got defensive compounds. Yeah. They're, you know, it, it is, it, it's, it's a universal defense against yeah. herbivores. And that's why agriculture has bred most of these compounds out. But, um, you know, I know that puppies will chew on things and, but animals are, they're not stupid. They don't right. go and seek out poison plants and, and eat them. So yeah. uh, I, there are people that are concerned about it, but I, I am not sure that it's a, a valid concern. Yes, I, I would agree. We've had that concern as well. Uh, it's really, you know, the dog owner, if they're concerned about that, obviously keep the plants, the dogs away from those plants, but I have not actually seen or heard of a dog that actually has eaten milkweed. So maybe that does happen, but I would just, you know, look at other, there's lots of other amazing native plant options out there. So um, you can also plant for monarchs. Um, if, you know, maybe others in your area are planting the milkweed, you can plant the asters and the goldenrod that help um, fuel the journey uh, of the monarch as well. So if that's a big concern, you can, there's lots of plants on these lists and we need all of them. So you can, right. be, you know, balance that out. You know, if you're, if you need to be convinced, get a milkweed leaf and eat it. It tastes terrible. Your kids will never eat that. Again, okay. you know? And I the can't National believe your dog Federation would like it either. I'm not recommending that. I do need to say a legal disclaimer there, Doug. <laughs> we are not, right? Just one leaf. Just one leaf. <laughs> We're not recommending you eat any native plants. Let's just be clear. Um, unless they are an herbal plant that is we know is safe. Um, so red osier dogwood is overtaking my unused high water table on the side yard. Is this a very desirable plant for insects? I guess the question is, should I keep it there even though it's overtaking the water table? Yes, yeah, so it's a great it's a great plant that does well in, in a wet area. You know, a lot of people work hard to get rid of your dogwood established. Um, dogwoods in general are not very high on the list in terms of supporting caterpillars, but they make wonderful berries for the birds in the fall that are very high in fats. It's exactly what the birds need. So, uh, and they, they do support, uh, with their flowers, they support uh, some of the lysinid butterflies. I've got red osier dogwood and I'm, I'm happy I've got it. I planted it, I wanted it. Here's a big question that we also often get. Native milkweed seems to be a slow grower in Florida, central Florida. Can I just go ahead and plant the non-native, which is tropical milkweed, which yeah. clean feeds? You know, there are, there are uh, boy, I, I've got to get this figure something like 75 species of milkweeds in the U.S. and they are adapted to particular soil types and particular heat levels. So if if you're using, you got to be using the right native in the right part of, of Florida. But uh, tropical milkweed, uh, particularly in Florida, has a serious problem. And that is that um, it, it, it does not die back from, from uh, cold. So it's a perennial that keeps on being a perennial. And what happens over time, the monarchs do love it. The leaves are soft. Monarchs don't care which milkweed they're eating. They like soft, tender milkweeds. And, and you know, Sclepius curasavaga is always tender, so they always love it. But the disease, OE, it's a, it's a uh, protozoan, I guess, builds up the, the um, they're not spores, whatever they are. The infective agents of that disease build up on the leaves. And there are places in the South, and Florida is one of them, where 90% of the monarchs that visit these plants get the disease. So you can plant it, but but it's it's a it's a typhoid Mary, excuse me, Mary. It it is a high, high transmitter of OE, which then the monarch uh, emerges with, with deformed wings. Um, for that reason alone. Uh, we we don't recommend it. I know it's pretty. I know it. It, it is, but we uh, we agree with that, Doug, and we recommend it not being planted in areas it's not native and it's not native to the U.S. Um, so uh, another big question here, which is a really good one. Oh, 
can I um, water my soil when native bees are nesting? Is that a problem if I water my garden and soil area where the native bees may be as well? That's a good question. I've never gotten that one. I think it depends on the degree. I mean, native bees can certainly withstand a, a rainstorm. If you're soaking, if you're flooding the tunnels, if you water enough to flood the tunnels, you'll, you'll kill them. Um, so I guess you have to decide. Uh, you really have the bees nesting right where the plants are. Um, that would be a conflict, I guess. Um, good question. Yeah, these are great, great questions. We have more coming, which is exciting. Um, are there keystone plants that compete with invasive plants and can eventually overtake them? Uh, it depends on which invasive you're talking about. So a, a real bad one at our house right now is Japanese stilt grass. You know, it's just it just covers everything. Uh, well, a real aggressive native that's a keystone plant is Canada goldenrod. Uh, and a lot of people say, don't plant it, it'll take over everything. So those two plants duke it out. And Canada Gold Run is, is a good competitor. The deer do eat it, they set it back. But boy, if I exclude deer, Canada Golden Rod wins. So yes, there are natives that will win, particularly when, when there aren't, aren't deer around. But that's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation. So, so somebody did a, a deer exposure experiment pitting garlic mustard against trilliums. And over a 10 year period, the trilliums won, believe it or not, uh, because it's, the deer weren't selectively eating the trilliums and leaving the, the garlic mustard. So our natives are pretty competitive when you don't have deer shifting that competitive balance. Um, but certainly some natives are a lot more aggressive than others. Uh, Virginia creepers, pretty aggressive. It, it can be a good ground cover. Depends on what it's competing with though. And the deer do eat Virginia creeper, so. That, that's great. Um, so this is a, a great one. I'm converting an acre of lawn to pollinator and bird friendly garden. In some places I'm only mowing desired paths, but letting the rest of the grass grow wild while I slowly replace lawn with native meadow plants. Is it okay to do it? Is there anything wrong with letting the lawn grow out in this way? Uh, um, well, what you get is tall, cool season European grass when you do that. Um, but you can shift the species composition of your, your meadow, starting with lawn, simply by the mowing schedule. L Larry Weiner suggests that if you want your lawn to shift over to native, native warm season grasses, uh, mow heavily in the spring and then don't mow at all in the summer. Uh, and, and then well, actually don't mow at all the rest of the year. So what you're doing is you're suppressing the cool season European grasses when they want to grow and, and produce the best. And you're tipping the competitive balance towards the native plant, the native grasses that do much better in the warm, warm seasons. Uh, and things like endopogon and, and, and uh, switchgrass and other things will come in and eventually dominate the, the site simply by mowing schedule. That's what he says. <laughs> Thank you. So I have another question. Is the full list of caterpillar, caterpillar species that are supported by each plant genera nationwide, like you showed in the presentation, Doug, available as opposed to this eco-region specific list? I'm not sure why you would want them by eco-region because that's what you would need to plant locally. So Well, we have that that data in, in our the, lab, in the, but- uh, And um, the native plant finder, right? Well, it, but that's filtered by county though. Right, right. So you can you can say, what does, what do tulip trees support in my county? And it'll give you the list of 21 species. Uh, nationwide, um, you know, what Kimberly does is she adds up everything from all the counties and comes up with a list, but I don't think that's, we don't have that publicly available. Yeah, and I'm curious, uh, Derek, if you, but let us know how, how you want to use it. That might be helpful to inform. We might have something. I'm not sure why you're looking for it. So if you want to email us about that, that'd be great. Um, soil in our area is clay, not very rich. This is Marilyn. Um, should soil be improved when planting native plants? Uh, in, in general, no. It depends on which plant you're planting, but you know, a favorite plant for, for uh, monarch is, is butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. And the easiest way to kill it is to give it really good soil and water it a lot. They like terrible soil that is dry. 
Uh, so you have to know the needs of your particular plant. Many of our, remember, particularly in the northern parts of North America were glaciated, the mm -hmm. soils were scraped off, and a lot of, and many of our plants uh, are adapted to low nutrient soil. When you fertilize them, it can actually kill them. Right. Uh, so it depends on which one you're, you're talking about, but uh, we, we have this notion you've got to improve soil for everything, and in most cases with natives, you don't. Right. Thank you. That's that's true. I think one thing to understand too, we have disrupted soil uh, in, in the areas we live so much. So to understand that these native plants do adapt better in the original soil conditions of a, a particular area with the right combinations of soil, the, the nutrients, the dryness level or the moisture level, it, each plant is different, but to Doug's point, um, yeah, it, it do not overwater, do not uh, over fertilize um, as well. Um, sometimes when you're starting a new garden for the, the, the seedlings, um, sometimes it's good to have uh, something that provides a little moisture until they get established. That would be the only thing I would recommend. Well, yeah, yeah. I, it, yeah. Even native plant. A lot of people plant yes. a plant and say it's native. I never have to water it. Yeah. You've got, <laughs> you've got to water it until the roots are, are um, you know, enmeshed with the, the soil. So yeah. once it's established, do you need regular watering and regular uh, yes. fertilization? Probably not. Yes. And we're excited for Sue Loomis, who has established a relationship with Japanese not, not weed, and she's intent on killing it day by day. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, okay. I think I've hit most. Let me make sure. Trisha, do you see any other questions that I didn't cover here? Oh, here's one. What is your general, some of these are in the chat now. What is your general opinion on dandelions? Hmm. Um, dandelions are an interesting one. I'm going to put them in the exception category. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's argument. There are native dandelions, first of all, but the one that it's in everybody's lawn is, you know, we pretty generally agree it's non-native although it's kind of circumpolar it's 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 everywhere and all continents um but uh there are a number of generalist caterpillars that do eat it and they they use it it blooms in your yard if you don't use a fertilizer with a broad leaf herbicide and provides uh, pollen and nectar for generalist bees typically honeybees and, and bumblebees um so, you know, if, you're, if your choice is a lawn with nothing in it and having it be completely dead or a lawn with blooming dandelions, the lawn with blooming dandelions is going to be more productive. You will be supporting uh, some things. Uh, so um, I, I, don't, I don't do anything with dandelions. And, and uh, I don't know if that's what you want to hear, but it goes against the culture, which is the culture says you have to have a perfect lawn or you're not a good person. So... We'd like to change that culture. <laughs> exactly. Um, we did get a couple of requests for the links to the article that you referenced that you guys did. You worked on with Desiree and Kimberly and everybody. Um, if you if you get a chance to, I think I have that too. I can put it, I can send it out to folks. I don't have it accessible for the chat right at the moment, but if you do, that would be great. Um, it's buried in the PowerPoint. I'd have that. That's all right. That's all right. We'll send it out. Um, and how important is pollen for bees as opposed to nectar? Very good. Oh, totally important. Bees reproduce on pollen. They're, they're uh, fueled by nectar. I mean, that's the sugar. That's the quick sugar that, that fuels their flight and everything. But the, the protein, the nutrients that create new bees comes from the pollen, not from the nectar. So when they're feeding their young, it is, it is pollen derivatives that feed the young. If you only had nectar out there, you would have no bees. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the questions. Um, yes, we agree. Why do people want golf courses for lawns? So boring. Doug, do you wanna talk about your challenge um, about lawns? Well, <laughs> yeah, I've talked about uh, reducing the area of lawn that we have. I mean, we've got over 40 million acres of lawn in the country, and that's a 2005 statistic, so we know it's more than that. That's an area the size of New England, and if you do what the culture says, it's a totally ecologically dead space that's ruining our watersheds. It's, it's the worst choice in terms of carbon sequestration. Uh, it is... Um, 
it's not supporting any pollinators uh, and, and it's not supporting the food web. So it's doing nothing over 40 million acres. That's no way to, to restore the biodiversity on this, this planet. Uh, it's a status symbol for the rich. So what, we, what I would like to do is, is the area of lawn that we keep, and you should keep lawn where you walk because it's a great plant to walk on without killing it. Uh, so, so where you walk frequently, you can have swaths of, of lawn. Um, that's going to be manicured. It'll show that you're still a good citizen and, and it'll be beautiful, but we're going to plant. That's where you put the keystone plants is in the half of the lawn we take, take out the keystone plants and the plants that support the specialists. And you can have, you know, you can have some, some, uh, plants that are there strictly for their appearance, for, for aesthetics. We, we do want beauty out there. We want people to accept this, but we're going to have a lot less lawn. So, yeah. Well, Thank you so much. I'm not seeing any new questions. Um, Trisha, thank you for putting that link to nature.com. I think that's Doug's um, article, uh, one of them. And oh, I just got a couple more questions just came in. Let me just uh, make sure I didn't miss any questions here at the end. Um, okay. Oh, when bees visit zinnia for nectar, which is a non-native flowering plant, do they pick up pollen even though it's not the kind they need or do they specifically not pick it up? <laughs> uh, you know, pollen it can stick to anything. You pick it up with your finger. Depends on how sticky it is. But so the answer is probably yes. I haven't examined a zinnia flower. I'm not sure where the pollen is. So sometimes it's in very specific places and only the specialist can reach it. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my guess is, yeah, they'll get some zinnia pollen uh, and, and maybe they'll pollinate a, a zinnia. Uh, that you know they're not going to pollinate a native plant with with that uh, the thing of it is can they use that do they use that pollen to rear their young and there's no nate no specialist bee that will do that right right thank you oh wonderful question is there an, any national movement to educate hoas regarding the fact that we don't need to have this required perfect long mentality and i can answer that and, and i don't i so has an answer for that. Um, but from specific education standpoint, Doug is doing it and he'll talk about that in a minute, just in general. But I also, HOA specifically, we have a program called Community Wildlife Habitats and the Mayor's Monarch Pledge at National Wildlife Federation. We just came out with a new uh, guidelines, a new book um, that actually um, helps HOAs understand and municipalities understand um, what there's some guidance around, you know, not necessarily having to have, you know, this weed ordinances and other kinds of things. So I will put that in the link um, as well um, and send it out to you. But Doug and his homegrown national park is a, a movement in itself around trying to educate people that you don't need that required perfect lawn mentality. So I, I, I suggest you we can change those rules, those annotated rules by joining your HOA and educating <laughs> the, the other members that these are rules made by people uh, so people can change them. And, and you know, it's it's happening. I'm getting more and more uh, emails from people to say I joined my HOA and we have just changed the rules and everybody's happy about it. So that's great. Marilyn, I hear just passed a, a law saying HOAs cannot tell you you're not allowed to yeah. play. Yes. What is it? You can't use native plants? Is that yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. You can't. And, and also a number of other rules. I'm in Maryland. Uh, a number of other rules around uh, trying to get homeowners not to use the excessive level of chemicals. Um, homeowners actually are right up there with the agricultural world in the amount of chemicals that we're putting into the environment. So that's another piece. I, and another question here come in um, around um, advice when dealing with walnut trees and compacted soil. I don't know. Okay, well, a lot of people think that nothing will grow under a walnut tree. You should come to my house where the squirrels have planted lots of walnut trees, <laughs> lots of things grow under them. Uh, but they do uh, ericaceous plants. So things like rhododendrons and azaleas are fairly sensitive to juglone. That's the chemical produced by particularly the walnuts themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't plant azaleas under your, your walnut tree. But other than that, I don't know of anything else that's really that sensitive to it. Um, compacted soil is, is an issue. Plant roots will break it up eventually over time, and if you're not continually compacting it. But of course, you know a, a uh, 700 pound lawnmower that you ride over it continually does compact your soil, particularly if you do it after a rain when it's wet. Um, 
So compacted soil is an issue. There, you know, there are ways to uncompact it that can be pretty aggressive. You get you get a, a plow with this big hook that digs down two feet and you rip the soil and it uncompacts it. That works if you want to do that, but the best way over time it will become uncompacted by plant roots. They're good at doing that. Thanks, Doug. I also just put in the uh, our new landscaping guide um, for um, and a blog on helping HOAs pass wildlife friendly property maintenance ordinances. So those are in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, thank you. Um, any other questions as we close here? Um, thank you all. Um, what a lot of questions about how this will be available. We will send out the link to everyone that participated on this. It'll be on our nwf.org slash garden website. Um, and so you can view it there. Um, we do have an NWF YouTube channel that's evolving. So I, I can't promise it'll be on YouTube just this minute. Um, Doug, do you have a YouTube channel? I don't have a channel. A lot of people okay. put my talks on YouTube and okay. then ask, ask me if they can watch them. I don't control yeah. any of that yet. I don't put them up there and I can't keep you from watching them. So, okay, well, watch, we will watch away. You know? The direct link to this and then we'll, I, uh, YouTube, I can't answer at the second. Um, thank you so much for all your participation, everyone. This has been really wonderful, wonderful questions, very engaging group. Thank you. And as always, thank you, Doug. Um, You're welcome. For your work and inspiration. I was so inspired. I met Doug in 2008 <laughs> at a Chesapeake Landscaping Conservation uh, Council where I heard his first talk um, and completely uh, inspired me and I uh, was so fortunate to, to work in this space and work with you. So thank you. <laughs> it's been fun, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone for this uh, amazing session and all your really terrific questions and have a, a great day. Now get out there in those backyards and plant those keystone plants. Don't forget your front yards. <laughs> and your front yards. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I got to run. I'll see you All right. Later. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.